Welcome to Being the Genuine Athlete podcast, where we inspire those who aim for excellence in life and want to understand the how and what it takes to be a champion in life. My name is Jura Koschak. My purpose, dedication and commitment is to activate your potential, that you understand the ego through your sport and life situations. So I share and give you the tools to be just this, the genuine athlete. Are you ready to tune in? So, three, two, one, or like uh, action. <laughs> Hello, uh, listeners and viewers of the podcast, Being the Genuine Athlete. I have a very nice lady special guest today, Madeline Barlow. Is that pronounced good? Yes, it is. Okay. <laughs> First, tell us where you come from. Hi, everybody. I'm tuning in from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania today it's beautiful out yay (laughs) everybody confuses slovenia with pennsylvania (laughs) sort of ish okay thank you very much i'll first uh, go into your details which i need to open again Uh, (laughs) i have them already here ready okay so um uh, you wrote some books we'll go over that today's uh, frame of the podcast is uh, Madeline Barlow, PhD. You dedicated 14 years uh, to the sport of swimming. You have a deep understanding of uh, mental side of sport, and I'm very sure of spiritual energy side as well. Um, you've had a lot of experiences during your career, and then you did a, a doctor as a doctoral student in exercise and sports psychology at Temple University. You conducted a research on athletic identity and the transition out of sport very important uh, subject which many many if not majority of athletes kind of forget uh, to work with during their careers Uh, and two aspects of her swimming career that affected her long uh, after she touched uh, that affected you long after you touched the wall of her final of your final race okay so you are working in a university can you tell us more about that Uh, what's your um, um, occupation there sure Yeah, so I work at Drexel University. So I went from Temple, which is on one side of Philadelphia to uh, the other, which is where Drexel is. And I am our mental performance coach and I work with all 18 of our varsity sports there. Uh, So I get to really support our athletes on the mental side of the game, um, whatever game it is that they are playing. And it's a really, amazing opportunity for me to just dive into all these different sports, team sports, individual sports, working with the team as a whole, then also working one-on-one with our individual athletes. And I've really loved the experience so far. Great. So you already covered a bit of the subject that we're going to talk about today regarding student athletes, everything that's happening since last year, 2020, and still going on this year. Uh, we'll also touch about your, uh, the subject of human design that you are working with and a bit on my uh, part of the numerology. Your books that you have written, amazing, so young, you just turned 30 <laughs> and you've written already two books and published them. Um, we'll touch, in, I think, in connection with your books regarding intuition, the impact that you can have as a coach, as an athlete, as a former athlete and some things about the future and tips. So let's get right into it. Uh, First of all, in brief uh, explanation, how did it affect you and how did it affect students 2020? What were the main concerns and how do you see, that's another question that can be connected. How do you see that a lot of students, athlete students were not preparing, didn't prepare their resilience for an emergency or a situation like that? Yeah, that's a really fair fair question uh, because in reality, I don't even think I did, right? Uh, We we never expected something like this to happen. Um, And yet it's a great lesson to recognize that while we don't need to be on edge to prepare for an emergency like this or a worldwide pandemic, what we do need are certain tools, certain skills that would allow us to navigate that. At the same time, those same skills will allow us to positively navigate anything we do in life. So why the heck not 
work on those skills. Um, so I would say personally, first and foremost, it has given me, this time period has given me the opportunity to do a lot of my own deep work. Uh, I really don't know if I would have gone as deep within myself if, I, if things had been business as usual, right? So on one hand, you know, kind of hate to say it, but a bit grateful for some of that opportunity um, just to be able to be within my own energy. I have been working from home for well over a year now, which has been really interesting. Uh, and that's been a very cool opportunity. We, like you said, we'll dive into human design. That's one of the things I've learned over the last many months about that's helped me learn about myself um, and ways to deal with anything that's thrown my way. Uh, this has been a really good opportunity for that for me. Um, on the other side with our student athletes, you know, some of the tools that I've been working with them on uh, are things that go into just deep self-belief. So confidence and just believing that they can accomplish whatever it is that's thrown their way or move through anything that's thrown their way when that belief stems from within themselves. That's probably been the number one uh, topic that I've gone over with our athletes over the last many months is how can we build confidence from within? How can we um, learn to be grounded in the present moment, right where our feet are, so much so that any worries of the future kind of roll right off our back or getting swept up in a past mistake, for example, or anything in the past in general, um, we're able to really come back to this moment. So believing in oneself deeply, having it have little to nothing to do with our performance, more so just, I believe in me, I believe in my training, um, and have that be so powerful that they can still feel that in any given moment. Okay, great, great. Thank you for uh, being honest and sharing things. This is important. Um, if I might add, I have been preparing for 2020, not the pandemic, but the coping, the adversity, the challenges that came with 2020 since 2010. Mm -hmm. uh, I have been using the skills, the tools that you've mentioned. I have been applying them, implementing them in my life. And ha I had more than a couple of quarantines since 2010 mm -hmm. in my head, in my body, sure. with my situations in life that I needed to implement and respond with certain skill set. And of course, mm -hmm. first know the skills and then implement them and use them appropriately when needed. So uh, that is great that you are, that many people are getting and are more and more aware of this and that you can give that, that to athletes because as you mentioned, this groundedness and especially if we can touch now, because I see how many athletes, let's just talk, focus on athletes, student mm -hmm. athletes or uh, otherwise have mm -hmm. been thrown away because of uncertainty. It's like mm -hmm. before 2020, everything was certain. Hell no. Yes. It just appeared that way. 2020 yeah. finally gave us a slap and something more in the face right. that everybody realized nothing is certain. Everything is an illusion and we need to be the grounded force, the channel, the spiral, the tree, the, with the roots, with good fundaments that then we can endure and cope with uncertainty in here, outside, uh, also injuries that happen because mm -hmm. let's face it you have been an athlete and you can share some things a bit later maybe or maybe okay. now in this uh, in this context with the athletes how when you suppress emotions when you don't express them or understand them or talk about them you get injured when mm -hmm. you are the weakest link in your physical body it's first is thoughts then is message messages uh, emotions feelings and then physical manifestation of your mm -hmm injury of your weakness in some sense. So please touch uh, something regarding uncertainty and injuries and in this case. Yeah, the uncertainty piece has been really big. And um, again, on a personal note, I, I feel very similar to how you were describing yourself feeling really prepared or have you, how you have been preparing over time to deal with something like that, right? With your, those skills. And that was interesting for me personally, 
where um, yeah, things felt like initially the rug was pulled out from underneath us. But for me, I noticed that I wasn't anxious, which was very interesting and, and new for me. And I thought, huh, everything's uncertain right now. Why am I not anxious? It was very interesting. <laughs> um, but I recognized that I had slowly but surely been leaning in to uncertainty. And as you mentioned, nothing is ever certain. Things are consistently changing. And I had within myself begun to recognize that. Whereas within the sport or the athlete community, there is that illusion of certainty. You know, I, I was a swimmer and um, we would have, you know, a, a meet sheet that was created prior to the meet and they would do their best to narrow it down to exactly the minute that you were supposed to jump onto the block to dive in for your race. Now, it didn't always go to plan as we all know, it usually ran behind, let's say that much. Uh, however, they tried to make it concrete, to make it certain of, okay, Madeline, you're gonna get on the block for 100 Butterfly at 9.56 a.m. Um, and feeling that or having that in your mind as an athlete does create that illusion okay, things are certain, or I know exactly the date of our championship meet. So I know how to plan for that precise date or set goals for that structured date. And this time we had none of that. It was all pulled out from underneath them. Um, and it was very clear where the holes were for people in terms of having those coping skills or not. So we have worked pretty hard to, again, lean in. That's the way I've described it. Not necessarily diving into the deep end because that's not gonna work for everybody, but leaning in to the consistent change in the world day to day. So it's been a very unique process for a lot of our athletes. And segueing into you know dealing with injury or dealing with, because um, injury can be uncertain or not can be, it is. There's a lot of uncertainty um, as much as I have a current athlete I'll, I'm thinking of right now who is very uh, wanting to be very structured with her recovery because they gave her a plan and said, okay, this week you'll be able to do this. And then the next week you'll be able to do that. And she's not on or she's not in line with that right now. And it's causing her, you know, some frustration, some anxiety around that. Um, and so it really is about, can we lean in to the potential for change or having to adjust, make some shifts rather than staying so rigid on that timeline. And when it doesn't work out, bringing in all of these uh, really powerful and negatively charged emotions perfect segue to what we were saying about holding those emotions and how they actually can be creating that physical manifestation of our emotions. That's been the other big thing that I've worked with many athletes and myself on over this time period. Can we recognize, can we recognize those feelings, those emotions that are coming in, coming through and feel them, honor them first and foremost rather than pushing them away. Because it's the pushing away, it's the pushing down that just builds like a volcano. I've been using that, that imagery of if we just let it build and build and build, it will come out one way or another. Often a physical representation of that. So like you said, being grounded right there in the moment, honoring the feeling, and letting it pass through because the only way out really is through. Great, great answer and your experience that you go with uh, the athletes through. And I like the leaning in. Uh, some can dive in, some yeah. are ambitious <laughs> on all sides. I was like that. I was like, let's go into that <laughs> BS. But yes. <laughs> um, then after being in that you know, situation and the cleansing, healing, uh, ah, it was a lot. Oh, it can be overwhelming. So it needs to be right dosage. Uh, okay, great. Um, 
let's touch a bit the human design and numerology and I can connect awesome. it with what you mentioned now. Mm -hmm. uh, in regards of, uh, I live in the Dominican Republic, just a small mm -hmm. uh, input, uh, and here nothing is certain. They never mm -hmm. had certainty here. So you go into mm -hmm. a bank and you don't know how long it will take. In Europe, where I come from, you know. They have now on the, a lot of years already in the crossing lights, they have, you know, the, the counting down how much time mm -hmm. the red light will be. That's, yeah. can, that can be a bit into our certainty programmation. Sure. But everything here is uncertain. You go to a doctor, you don't know how long it will take. And I have in my mind as an European, I know, I need to know. So this mm. knowingness. And what I what I have noticed already with me in the past past years as a as an athlete, till 2011, I was playing table tennis professionally. And then afterwards as a coach with athletes and non-athletes as well, I've noticed that this people tend to be so much I know, I need to know but they don't have their minds open to know yeah. thyself as it is written, I think in Greece, in some Parthenon or somewhere, Olympic thing, know thyself. I don't know who said it, Socrates or uh, not Pilates. <laughs> Pilates is something like something else, not a Greek, Greek God or a Greek <laughs> philosopher. <laughs> okay, so uh, what you mentioned, when you have this uncertainty, something comes up, something is triggered, is stirred, comes up to the surface. And athletes who get injured or who lose or who are defeated normally tend to have a response. And that response is actually why they lost or why they are injured or why their injury rehabilitation plan doesn't go to the plan. So whatever you feel is the gap that's gapping you or uh, mm -hmm. separating you from the result itself. So why do losers cry? Not because they lost, but because they lost because they cry. Mm. So if they deal with the emotion before, they can be winners because winners don't have that emotion. So mm. there's always a winner and the winner is the, is the person or the team who has more positive energy, who has dealt with the pressure, who doesn't succumb under pressure. And the person who is frustrated because everything doesn't go to plan, I can now say generalization that ladies have a very expectation expectation full idea of how life and relationship should go and you have a lot of of course with that setting points fundamentally that you can fall into the triggers because nothing goes to plan in life in generally life is life life is full of surprises so uh, i do i work with numerology we'll go into that a bit later i i would like you to explain how human design works uh, works with what you've came across in this time uh, because this is knowing thyself. And when you know mm -hmm. what your program's triggers are, then you can verbally, physically, whatever, organically realize and become present with them. And you know, oh, I'm in that program again, aren't I? But if you don't know, you are in the, I don't know that I don't know. You're in the blind spot and it's like always chasing you. So this mm -hmm. is why I know that you work and use the human design and you are fond of it and this is why I also sent you and I work with numerology and archetype so please let's close the gap and yeah. know thyself yeah I love that uh, human design for me similarly I feel the way you feel about numerology and archetypes and all of that is really um, <clears throat> it's become this big permission slip for me to be myself and to really understand or once again lean in to the way that I am designed to exchange my energy in this world, because we're all energy. Everything is energy. That is very clear. Uh, you know, it's it's clear in hard science, right? And it's clear in the not so hard science. I will not call it soft science because I don't like that term. <laughs> and in religion as well. Everything <laughs> exactly. is energy. Prayer Everything is energy. Everything yeah. is energy. Um, and so like you were just mentioning around, you know, individuals that tend to, or typically win in their sport are carrying more of that positive or even like higher frequency energy, the higher vibrational energies of joy, of love, of peace, of, you know, all, all of that, um, versus things like fear, shame, guilt, and there's plenty more as we know, but yeah. 
those are some of the, you know, high vibration emotions versus lower vibration. And what human design allows us to um, observe about ourselves is one, the way we're meant to exchange the energy in the world that's correct for us and will lead us to face less resistance and more ease. Things will just click when we are aligning with our design. And really quickly, so human design is based on astrology, <clears throat> excuse me, astrology, um, physics, that part I will never understand because I don't understand physics and that's okay. I don't need to. Um, <laughs> physics, the I Ching, which is a Chinese text, uh, the Kabbalah, which is the tree of life, and the seven chakras of the um, uh, you know, original or originating chakra system. So it, it combines all of these together to give you what's called a body graph and shows in different areas of your subtle body, so your, um, you know, your energetic body, what you might be holding there that is not yours or is not meant to be yours. So conditioning that you've picked up from your parents, your society, your coaches, your teammates, friends, et cetera. And then the things that you are meant for or that are meant for you rather, right? The, uh, the things that highlight your truest and even highest self. So it allows you to distinguish that the more you dive into, because I do dive into human design, that is something I go head first into. Um, and starting you know, from the root to the crown. And there's a lot of areas in the body, there's nine in human design where you can pick up this conditioning and it's about learning how to unbecome. I like that term, unbecoming the things that no longer serve you or rather never have because they're not yours to hold. Uh, we've been talking about you know, honoring our emotions so that we, way we can let them go or release them to make room for all that's meant for us. So we must first recognize it, that that's there. Maybe it is fear. Fear tends to live in the root chakra and in human design as, as well. Um, so can we recognize where we hold fear if we're not meant to hold that fear uh, and let it go. Finding ways or using tools to release it and then making more room for us to tune in to what we are meant for in that area. So that's just one example. Um, that's the unbecoming piece. Whereas again, we have the leaning in, leaning in to how you are designed to use that energy. Um, in, we'll go with the root once again. The root is a press, pressure center in human design. If you have it defined as in it's consistent for you, which I do, um, it means I work well with pressure. I like pressure. Pressure is good for me. Deadlines are good for me. And I've always been a person that without knowing human design that said, I get stuff done. I always get stuff done if I have a deadline. If I don't, it's kind of a nightmare. Let me just, <laughs> so I have to set, set my own deadlines. Um, whereas some people actually aren't designed to perform well with deadlines. And so that would be, um, that would cause some resistance if they're trying to give themselves these deadlines or someone is giving them a hard and fast deadline. Knowing that about ourselves, one allows me to lean in and allows another person to lean in to the flow instead. So that's a bit about human design. I'd love to hear more about your side of things or if you have any thoughts around human design. No, I, I love the simplicity and the explanation um, of the human design and how it combined all of the different uh, knowledges, wisdoms, mm -hmm. uh, because it's necessary. And in a yeah. way uh, we are going we are in the information age, we are going, we are in the Aquarius, we are in the mm -hmm. manifestation now in the higher realms and paradigms where we are going into. 
into new kingdoms if we are dramatic or romantic <laughs> um, because this is happening this is now just the transformational phase where we are in people if they listen to the media they can be misled uh, especially sure. athletes as well and everything that's uh, the agenda now but will not go into politics or any of these things <laughs> uh, i always tell myself and my clients and the people around me um don't look at something that's downgrading you or pulling you down, yep. downward spiral. Work on yourself. Uh, this, these times will pass as well as good times pass, bad times bad, pass, bad good as an adjective in a sense. Sure. Uh, because everything is just meant to be. It's, it's, it's a lesson. It's a growing phase. So regarding the human design, I like the com combination and um, numerology might also be included. Maybe not now, maybe in the future. We'll see how it can be uh, put together because it's also about checking your programs that you get from your parents parents mm -hmm. give you your name or if we go higher souls we decide our parents choose them and choose the name as well uh, mm -hmm. it's not that you are determined but as well as in human design once you know thyself once you understand yourself you can begin to mold differently and you are the pilot and not the autopilot your programs your yes. parents ego that you that we developed through different traumas mm -hmm. in the childhood and different ego right. identities strong suits mm -hmm. um and, and and neurology and human design just reflect like with a reflector with a big flashlight strong flashlight it illuminates it where the issues are and you begin to mold it you begin to use it so neurology also shows these programming from society and where you are triggered and headed if you do not understand where you lose vital energy of life because right. we all are born with some sack of energy yeah. and then how you can use because we all just have energy the issue is it's like that story the legend the anecdote of uh, you we all have two wolves uh, depends mm. which one you feed the negative the vicious one or the positive the loving one so it's the same thing uh, with more knowing ourselves understanding we can begin to feed the good part, because we have energy. The thing is, when you don't know, you put attention, you give attention to the negative side and you feed the negative side. And this is how we abuse life in a way. But yeah. we, we are beings of free will. Uh, we have free will. We can do whatever we want in one way. So now it's our turn, our power, our way, how to impact with regardless of... It can be a, a jotish if you're familiar with, it can be palm reading, it can be coffee reading, uh, it can be uh, very specific. There are a lot of evaluation, diagnostics, uh, these psychological evaluations that also go into spiritual realms uh, online. It's a lot of things. It's like food. Some, someone likes to eat Indian, someone more Asian, more spicy, someone likes to eat European, someone Mediterranean. It's, yeah. it's available for us to grow. Whatever the yeah. name might be, it can be human design or numerology. It's regardless what the name is, if you can use it, implement, and if, can, if it can do good for you, that you become a person of a higher, higher being, higher vibration. So in that sense, I am doing numerology since 2010, and I've done more than, I think, 600 and more, 6,000 uh, 6, readings. Six thousand wow, yes. because I was doing them to everybody on the airplane, Amazing. in the post, uh, when I was buying in the shop, I was doing it to everybody in numerology reading. I just Amazing. knew the, the, the name tag and I was doing it uh, because it's vivid. Uh, I walk on the street and I know which lady is a uh, more sexual kind because number six is more sexual manipulation. Mm -hmm. In that case, doesn't necessarily be negative, but I know which lady attracts in that way. Also men, of course. Mm -hmm. um, so I noticed I have this now already embedded in me. I've been using it, as I say, more than 11 years. I have a lot of experience. I still am amazed whenever I do the reading uh, to whoever I do it. I don't interfere with what comes down, how I de decipher, decode the numbers. It's as right. well you do with the human design. You get certain mm -hmm. depictions and, and stats that you then read as a doctor reads the blood, uh, mm -hmm. blood picture, blood, uh, what's, it, what's it called? Blood things which you get in the laboratory, the analysis. Yeah. So in the same sense, yep. uh, we tend to help in that way. Um, uh, do you have any questions regarding this? Because I've sent you some... Sure. Uh, not necessarily questions, but I will just say, you know, for those listening, 
again, and you, and you mentioned this, it goes for human design, it goes for numerology. There's so much that, there's so much, let's put it that way, right? There's so much in a, in a good way, but allow it to be what it is. Um, take in what really resonates, what feels really supportive. Yeah, yeah good one. I think yeah, is so important, right? And, and again, goes for either of what we're doing, anything else. Um, and that's what I've really resonated with in general with like um, diving into my spiritual self is taking what resonates and what feels supportive. And in the moment, there might also be things that I'm like, oh, what? No. Right? And I, have, I felt that way about a couple things when I learned of my human design. And even when you shared my numerology with me, there are a couple things I'm like, oh, feels like I just got slapped in the face. Right. But, <laughs> but in an okay way at the same time. Um, so taking what resonates initially, also letting things sit or simmer, seeing if they come through in a different way in time, uh, and also being able to look at those hard truths and see, well, what, what can I read from this? You know, what message can I really take and how can I use that to grow versus looking at it as, oh, this person just told me, even though you're right, it's not necessarily you or me, it's what's literally quote unquote in the numbers, <laughs> right? Um, uh, someone just told me I'm, I'm a nasty perfectionist, right? It's like, okay, that's the only thing I could think of in the moment, right? But it's just, huh, okay, well, what is, what does that mean? And how is that showing up in my life? Um, and it can, this goes for individuals who, you know, who clearly aren't athletes just as much as it can go, for athletes, and I know if I had had access to this uh, when I was an athlete, oof, it would have been really interesting to apply to that experience, an experience where there was just so much room for that conditioning. I was taking on so much conditioning and not, not at all aligned with my design, with what you've shared with me in terms of my numerology. Um, and yet now about eight years later, it's so eye-opening. You've described it as like opening the blinders, you know, widening your perspective. Uh, and it's really helped me to do that. And it's definitely helped others that I've shared it with open their blinders and see more about what's right in front of them and what's within them. Good, good, good points. And the last one, uh, let's just dive in right now before we head into the books that you've written. Mm -hmm. um, how athletes are amazingly like horse blinders. Yes. They want <laughs> to succeed and do whatever it takes to win, but they don't do whatever it's necessary. It's like every yeah. good coach will put you through a psychological evaluation. And you mm -hmm. have many of them, as you said. Of course, it's the ego part that prevents you to uh, acknowledge where you're weak, but you want to be good, but you don't check your weak, weak spots and blind spots. Yeah. It's like, how can yeah. we now, of course we cannot push, but how can we incentivize sure. and, and intentionally move and open up athletes? Please, right. please wake up. Please check different like human design, neurology, whatever, coffee readings, psychological right. elevation. Just do it because it's good for you in the end. Yes, it hurts right. the hard truth that you hear about yourself. But mm -hmm. if you don't hear it, the truth will set you free anyway. Yeah. You need mm. to know it. So how can you maybe right. add in this sense to please just because it will be it will make our life easier. Oh, totally. <laughs> when athletes will be yeah. more um, open. Right. Right. So the first thing that popped in my mind as we were talking about conditioning and where we often get the most of it as an athlete is our coach. And so on one hand, I often share and say, let go of the need or want to change your coach and have them, you know, do things in a different way or in a way that would be even more beneficial or supportive for you because we can't control them. But if there are any coaches listening to this, <laughs> which I hope there are, um, a, a beautiful step would be for coaches to begin opening their blinders and letting in, even if it's a little bit at a time, letting in these new ideas, 
especially as we continue to move forward as a society and so many people are waking up to all of this and are opening their own blinders, I really, really invite coaches to begin doing that because the few coaches, because I say few, it's because it's not a ton. There aren't a ton that are already doing this, but there's a few that I personally work with who are extremely open to the work I do and they trust it because they trust me. Um, and that has allowed the work I do with the coaches and their athletes to be extremely valuable. Um, so when we open the blinders and let in, again, it doesn't have to be this big shift all at once. But little let bits. in little bits, yes, little bits and see what it feels like, test it out. Human design, once again, is like an experiment. Try, learn about it and then start with one thing at a time. Just try it out. Hmm, what would it feel like to make this shift right there? See what it does. Does it cause more or lead to more ease in your life? Does it release you of a lot of frustration? Interesting, pay attention. Okay, let me do a little bit more of that. So it's really this big experiment. And I would say that coaching is often an experiment because you, we can't do the same thing again and again and expect to continue growing. So on one hand, I do feel it would be so valuable for coaches to begin opening their blinders because the athletes listen to them. The athletes respect them, hopefully, anyways, um, if they've built that culture. So that's one really beautiful place is can we get it to be sh shared from the top down? Cool. And then on the other hand, if we can't, which is possible, sure, there's going to be plenty of people not open to opening <laughs> their blinders. Uh, at the individual level, same thing. Can they slowly but surely open the blinders to see a little bit more beauty and a little bit more um, nuance to the things outside of that very focused tunnel vision? I like to try to help them expand their blinders so they can bring in more joy because joy is again, one of those really high vibrational emotions. And if we can let more of that in, it makes the room for us to show up in our sport and life in a more grounded way, in a, just a more brilliant way in all sense of the term, um, sharing that energy with the people around us, but being so filled up with that joy, we can move through just about anything that's thrown at us. Um, so instead of being so focused just on the outcome or uh, on winning, for example, open the blinders, let in all these different supportive um, tools, start applying them little by little, pay attention to how they make you feel and use that as motivation to do more. Beautifully said and powerful. And that's what, that's what society needs now, growing, learning, moving forward, uh, right. breaking through these old paradigms conditions. Yeah. Thank you. Very good. Yeah. Um, let's touch now, uh, if you can input, because I think it is a big part. I haven't read your books yet, but I think it is a big part, intuition and joy. You do want to impact and influence the society and athletes where you work and who you work with also through books. And you've written yeah. two books. One is Athlete to Entrepreneur, and the other one is Highly Sensitive Athlete. Please share some things about your book that the uh, listeners, viewers can understand. And I'll put the link into your site so that they can access them. Awesome. Yeah, so this has been a dream. I've always wanted to write a book, <laughs> always. I, th I think it's one of those things uh, that is in my design is to share in this um, form. I love speaking. I love talking with people, but there's something about uh, just sitting down and writing, not pen to paper anymore because I typed it obviously <laughs> on a computer, yeah, yeah. right? But sitting and writing um, and just sharing my voice in that way. But really it's also a way for me to um, help others find their own voice. I'd say that's the intention of both of these and not just voice, but their purpose, their path, whatever that means to them. 
And so the, the first book, Athlete to Entrepreneur, is a co-authored book. So I'm in that book with a number of other individuals who were athletes, uh, and they now are, again, living their purpose. They've just similarly to me, you know, I am doing what I've always, what I always wished I could have had access to when I was an athlete. I wished I had someone like me. So I became that for my past self and also for all of the athletes out there um, now that are looking for similar support. So that's the gist of that chapter within the book is of that journey. Just like I said, I definitely had some struggles to say the least when I was an athlete and I did the best I could with what I knew, but I wish I had known more at the time. And we can't uh, go back in time. I can't change, you know, what I did then. But what I can do now is, again, learn everything I can, which is what I've been doing. I've learned it. I've been learning again and again. I love to learn and then share that. Share that with those that are looking for it, which has been amazing. So that's the Athlete and Entrepreneur book. And the second one is fully mine, which is amazing. <laughs> really, wow. really wild to think about. Um, and that is the highly sensitive athlete. And as we've been talking here today, and even before you know, we started recording, we talked about us both being highly sensitive individuals. And I wanted to take back the power around what it means to be sensitive in sport specifically, because when I ask people, well, what does sensitive mean to you? Typically, it just comes through as like, oh, well, it means overly emotional, which isn't totally off base. Uh, however, um, that really is more hypersensitivity. Hypersensitivity is when we just feel like we have no, uh, no control over the way our emotions come out or how we display emotions and the behavior that comes around that, typically coming from, you know, past traumatic experiences or just, you know, experiences we've had as a child um, or growing up, et cetera. And it's led us to not have those coping skills that we've been talking about this whole time. Whereas being highly sensitive or the trait of being highly sensitive is to feel more, to feel and feel more deeply to understand things on a deeper level, to observe more deeply and to notice the little details of things, being really perceptive of others' feelings, of others' behaviors. Um, so basically, you're just deep. <laughs> you're a deep human. And there's nothing negative about that in my eyes. I think it's one of the most beautiful things on this planet. And yet it has the potential to be overwhelming if we let it be, if we give it that power. So in this book, uh, it's a combination of my own journey as a highly sensitive athlete and recognizing that you can be both. You can be an athlete and be highly sensitive and be yourself. You don't have to cover it up you don't have to put on this mask and pretend you're more outgoing or you're less sensitive or you're okay just, you know, rubbing some dirt on it all the time. You don't have to do that. You can be yourself. You can embody your true self. And that's where the magic is. It's in taking off the mask and showing up as the highly sensitive athlete you are. So I do provide, um, again, my journey, the, a lot of things that have come through in the many, many highly sensitive athletes I've worked with, um, as well as specific tools, specific practices that people can start implementing to slowly but surely remove the mask in sport for those that read it that are current athletes, and then also after sport. So I go through that trajectory as well. Um, if you're a current athlete, these are some of the things you can do. And this is why sensitivity is a superpower if you view it that way. And then after sport, whatever life you choose to live after sport and how you can continue to be your true self, or maybe that's the first time you take off the mask and live as your true self. And this is 
how you can do that. Great. I'm amazed that you've written your books. My book is still downloading. I know that I will yeah. do it, but very good that yeah. you've written it. Uh, Thank you. I will read them. And they are, as I see it, uh, now I connected some points intuitively. Um, your books are complementary because we'll get into that on the tips. I already written some tips for the end, so stay tuned. <laughs> um, complementary in a sense. When you're open, no blinders, when you're available and you do everything and what's necessary to be done in your career, you don't need, you don't have fear or worries for after career because you've learned everything. You have developed your skill set. You have your uh, joy of life for life. So you are just amazed in transitioning to another phase of life after career, after being a professional athlete with the highest possible uh, body movements and, and the performance. Uh, and you just transition into other side. I've met a lot of athletes, uh, come across them. Also one swimmer, Sara Isakovic, she's a, I think she's a silver medalist from Beijing uh, Olympics, uh, Slovenian. She studied uh, psychology and neuroscience, brain science in Berkeley. So oh, in that cool. sense, she's also a representation of a genuine athlete and a lot of athletes, other that I did mention now, I mentioned her because she's, she's a swimmer. She was a swimmer mm -hmm. like you. And in that sense, when you prepare yourself, when you have that calmness, inner calmness in a, you, know, you have a higher threshold for stress, mm -hmm. for pressure. Yeah. I think it's, the term is also poise. Is mm -hmm. it in some sense yeah. you have that poise, that yeah. calmness that's, that you are actually vibrating and shining and emitting in some sense then you're happy for whatever's coming in future. Then you're excited. Then you have that experimentation in you, that research curiosity. Not everybody's the same. We don't want to throw sure. everyone in the same basket. We are of individuals course. and different, but those are some fundamentals that I go through and very probably you go through with yourself and with your clients, with your athletes to do it the right way. And when you do it the right way, everything else just falls off, diminishes. And we feed, we begin to feed the right, as you said it also, give attention to the right sense because I'm born on the 8th, just today is my birthday. And I'm also very profound and deep and very analytic. And I needed to learn so much about myself in order to use this over analysis because it becomes paralysis that yeah. I can now implement it and use it for good. And use mm. it to grow, to contribute, to share, to... Yes. evolve in that sense that it doesn't block me right but that's the case that we are going over with um so yeah. after athlete career is important and i think we covered this subject quite well and you do with your books so please all the listeners check out the links and the books to, uh, read them um let's touch the almost less subject the future future for mm -hmm. you what you see how you see it uh, for athletes uh, we are still in this 2020 phase, sort of. <laughs> I personally do not believe uh, that it will end until 2024. I had some of these uh, confirmations. Um, there will be a lot of pressure on certain agenda, which yeah. we will politically not touch uh, or yes. talk about. <laughs> but um, I know that this is a transition and every transition needs to happen in a way, everything what's old, what doesn't function anymore. And there was a lot of things that didn't function needs to be like demolished completely and this is happening now and people are letting go first leaning in now they're beginning to let go of how it was and living into the new future what do you yeah. see yeah i definitely agree with that and whether it's you know outside of sport or just as much within i think there's certain things within sport um you know especially the things that have been broadcast in the media in terms of, you know, in the um, NCAA basketball tournament and the disparities between the men's and women's competition and things like that. You know, those are things that have been happening for decades. And now everything is being revealed. Yeah. Everything is out on the open. Exactly. And good. We are stripped good. naked in a way. Yes, so exactly. Now, now is the time to, right. to actually... Let's do it. Yeah. And that I 
feel is what had to happen for us to, uh, you know, break down these barriers completely, like knock the wall down, truly. Um, and so that's just one example, but there's clearly so many others within sports specifically. Uh, and then even just on the interpersonal level, you know, when it comes to the work I do on the mental side of sport, there's still been a stigma around navigating your mental wellness in sport. Uh, and so that's another thing. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's wild because how can we possibly believe that we can be successful on any level in something like sport only at the physical level? Our physical body can only do so much. And we all come, have a- You come from a, excuse me, you come from a yes. nation, nation that's built on belief. And it's a yes. mental thing. It's a spiritual <laughs> thing. It's an energy thing, vibrational thing. Right. And yet, no, no, no. I yes. will not touch that part of the processor of the hardware right. software because what? What's right. the what's the stigma? Why is this why is this fear? Right. Yeah, because you know, at least in my experience, because I'm sure everybody in you know in a position like mine will have a different experience. Uh, but it definitely starts with that fear of oh, does that mean I have to look in the mirror and, and, and oh, is there something wrong with me? Yeah. Oh, I need, I need help. So I'm, there's something bad about and me. And athletes are not allowed to show that they are weak. Correct. That there's that huge conditioning around I'm an athlete. So I'm tough and being tough means I can do it on my own. But what I'm here to tell people is is that you've never done it on your own, first and foremost. There is no athlete on this planet who has done what they do by themselves. Either they've had a team surrounding them the entire time, they've had a coach, probably many different ones, at any point in time from the moment they first started in their sport. Mm -hmm. They've had a coach, they've had a team. More than likely on some level, I know every family is different, but they've had some type of familial support. And then they've also, yes, supported themselves because it does have to come from within at a certain point too, but never ever have they done it alone. So why do we continue to hold so tight to that belief that, oh, I must go it alone when it comes to the mental side, when it comes to what's coming through in in my mind in my heart etc having support on that side is just as important as having the support on the physical side of things um and so really what in my opinion and in the opinion of so many others i feel you know that i'm i, I work with or i work alongside the strongest thing you could actually do is ask for that support versus that's it the strength, within is showing, yourself. the strength is showing your weakness and that's what yes. every business person, yes. every athlete successful says and proves. Yeah, so yeah. Exactly. So there's another piece, another aspect of the sport culture conditioning that is breaking down. It is, I see it breaking down. It's not like a full blown, um, you know, they're, they're knocking it all down at once. I think it's one brick at a time still in some ways, but then again, maybe 10 bricks at a time right now versus one, how it used to be. Uh, because clearly with all that's been going on the last year plus, uh, people have really realized all that this encompasses, the mental side of sport, because it's not just in the mind, it's not just the head, it is the heart just as much. It is the, you know, the emotions that are felt in the body and if we're holding all these emotions in our body you really think you're going to have room to physically show up in your sport mm -mm. there's no room and people are like why can't i like i know what i'm doing i can do it in practice why can't i do it when it really counts there's no room there's no room for any of that to shine for your body to do the work because we've let our body fill up with emotions that are not meant to be held. So those are the many things I do feel are really coming through. I even had a meeting with 
to coaches, to, uh, to male coaches yesterday who were like, help, help us. There's, a, there, there's just too much. And it's now coming out on our athletes. They looked in the mirror. Gosh, I was so proud. I'm like, they looked in the mirror and they said, this is not how we want to be. What can we do? Amazing. And, and you work with 18 teams. 18. <laughs> 18 coaches and more. Uh, yeah, so 18 or maybe a little less just because there are some coaches that, that coach cover, yeah, both yeah. sides, but a good number. And then, you know, we have our assistant coaches as well. And like I said, not all of the coaches have come to me in the way these two did yesterday. Let's put it that way. Yes. Right. But um, for them to be so open, their blinders opened. And what did I share with them? I shared with them breath work. And they were like, yes, amazing. Right. So for them to do that, this is a, that's a perfect example. I'm glad it happened yesterday. Perfect timing um, for them to re be really open to trying something new because they had this experience that we, again, if things were just business as usual, this might not have happened. They might not have ever for the next several years had enough buildup and then it was starting to come out in that way for them to realize, huh, Maybe we do need to take a look in the mirror and do something on our own for ourselves. So that way we can show up for our athletes the best way we, we can. Great. But, yeah, beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you. We are coming to the closure. Um, and I think it's um, appropriate or good because if I share this, what I've noticed in society now, there are protests all around the world. In some countries mm -hmm. more, uh, right. People are getting are fed up with all the restrictions and the life that we are living and the uh, very not so mortal thing that's around us, but it's used. And Amnesty International also issued a report that it's completely um, well, violating human rights, how mm. governments are dealing with this issue. Uh, and I see it that with violence, with... Um, despair and emotions and frustration uh, this side that understands cannot break through this has been shown with gandhi and with many other gurus and teachers that came to earth and jesus or someone else that was all pure love and pure light mm -hmm. and this is where we are now and this is the future and thankfully two coaches coming to you and many athletes are opening so the future is bright i always know that we are going into light and some yes. kingdom however you name it uh, and um, but the thing is we need to learn to be in this calmness strong right being calm when the thunder is shaking the earth when the earthquake is coming do not lose your temper and mm -hmm. i have certain tips that we've covered today just sort of a feedback or, or a, um, what's the word retrospect in some some way what we've yes. talked today what we've touched regarding energy and regarding these tips that then you can build your threshold higher, your vibration, your awareness higher, that then you can respond in the most uncertain time, in the most pressure time, in the most completely illogical restriction, you can respond with wisdom and with calmness and with mm -hmm. love and non emotion, but love that it's pure heart. So right. uh, as you mentioned, unbecoming, I love this word, yeah. letting go and unbecoming, yeah. because we, a lot of, I think Einstein also said it, Albert Einstein or someone else, we need to unlearn whatever we learned, yeah. unlearn. Now is the time to unlearn everything and let right. go and come to the roots, knowing thyself, as we mentioned, use, if it's human design, it's human, if it's astrology, astrology, numerology, whatever mm -hmm. it may be, use something uh, that yeah. you can then learn about yourself. Good that you mentioned a couple of minutes ago breath work that you did with the yeah. coaches. Um, you can share something about that tip, breath. I've come across the Buteyko method, uh, measuring your um, lack of oxygen, your hunger for oxygen. You mm. exhale and you measure how long you can withstand without. Mm. And inhale, that's a very important part. I might share this uh, in, in, the, in the links of the podcast because nose breathing, nose is for breathing, mouth is for everything else, kissing, mm -hmm. drinking, eating, and talking. Yes. Nose is for breathing. Too many athletes and coaches especially do not 
put attention to breathing. It's like yeah. we have the tool just in front of our nose that's actually nose. Yeah. <laughs> and we don't use it. It's like, I'm anxious. Well, we'll breathe. <laughs> It's like, yes. I don't know where well, so breathe. True. It's like, it's here. It literally, right. I think God or whoever said it, the solution, solution is in front of your nose. It is nose. <laughs> it is nose. I love that. It's so, so true. Please share maybe one, one exercise or something about breath work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When it comes to breath work, uh, you know, I only first tried it, I guess, last March. It was literally a few days before the world shut down. The meltdown, uh, and, yeah. Yes. And um, I, being a swimmer, you know, I was pretty used to breathing patterns, right? That's something that we, we did learn um, and that we did use. Granted, you couldn't breathe out of your nose because you would have choked on the water and that wouldn't go well, right? But it's interesting to think about now that you're saying that, I had become really accustomed to breathing in and out of my mouth. Very fascinating. I'm going to table that for myself to think more about. I love it. Um, so when I first did breath work, though, I noticed in my mind, my competitive mind came back on line and said, Madeline, you were a swimmer. You can't, you can't breathe before anybody else. Like, hold your breath. Don't let go. It was very interesting how that came up and through right away. Uh, and now it's now that I've had a consistent practice of breath work daily, even if it's just five minutes a day, um, that competitive mind does not come through. It's simply about being, just being there. And while I still will often use a breathing pattern, let's say one day I need to breathe a little bit sooner or something. It's okay. That compassion comes through more so than the competitiveness, which is really cool. So it is about being consistent. It's something I share with the coaches, just like anything else, it's consistency. It's about doing it again and again, not just doing it one time and hoping for a result. Uh, and so the, the one I most often share with people right away is four, seven, eight breathing, where we breathe in for four seconds, hold it for seven and slowly and controlled breathe out for eight, where that out breath is the most important piece, being longer than the in breath, because the out breath is what's slowing down our nervous system, bringing us into more of that rest and digest state versus that anxious state of what you were describing of that like survival fight or flight state that we're so often caught up in. And so really using this technique to remind our body that it is safe where we are, right where our feet are. There's no lion across the way waiting to come devour us and we don't have to run away from it or try to fight it. Even if something in our life does feel like a proverbial lion, uh, we still have the tools within us to bring that down and make the decisions or choose how we want to respond in that moment versus letting things just come out out of instinct. So four, seven, eight breathing is always the first one I like to share with people. Great, amazing, because uh, we will not go into the, um, all of the method and all of the breath work, uh, yeah. but it's good that you, we exhale more. The problem is that we want to intake more. We, we, mm -hmm. we have hunger. That's why mm -hmm. the world is collapsing because we had too many things materially, and we were afraid that we will be in scarcity. So we were just grabbing from greed and whatever, analyzing right. now. But in that sense, exhaling more helps the body. Uh, I can also share a link with from Dr. Boteco method and why and how help it helps for the athlete and of course also non-athlete body. Because we have when we have too much oxygen in, we have this balance with carbon dioxide. And right. our body is completely in survivor mode. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, it's good um, that we breathe through nose, that we exhale more, good exercise. Thank you very much. It was amazing. Uh, please just share. I will give you the final word because ladies need to have the final word. You, <laughs> you, are, you are the um, love of this life. You bring love and life mm -hmm. uh, to, to the world. You are mothers or to be mothers in that sense. And um, 
joy joy is what we need and love is what mm -hmm. we need what we are mm -hmm. so thank you very much it was amazing the thank you so much yours. yes this was so amazing i loved this conversation and i hope this gets to the ears of absolutely everyone that is really looking to hear this and needs to hear this on a soul level so thank you for having me thank you for tuning in follow me on being the genuine athlete instagram and facebook page Share, like and comment and be genuine all the way.